Welcome to Better by Great Place to Work, the podcast that helps companies create a great workplace for all because it's better for people, better for business, and better for the world. I'm Christopher Tkachuk, the Chief Content Officer at Great Place to Work. Each week, we meet with great leaders who have helped their companies become better workplaces by focusing on their best asset, their people, who in turn help their organizations become more successful. Support for Better comes from DHL Express, the global market leader in international express delivery. Welcome to Better by Great Place to Work. We're coming to you today from the 2020 Great Place to Work for All Summit in San Francisco. Our guests today are Marcus Erb and Sarah Lewis Kulin, who happen to be my colleagues. Welcome, guys. Marcus is the Vice President of Data Science and Innovation, and Sarah is the Vice President of Global Recognition. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is how you guys are the brain power behind everything that we do here at Great Place to Work. Um, our boss, the CEO Michael Bush, has said this over and over again, that you are the brain trust of, of what we do, and that we would not be able to have the uh, resources and, and the extension of uh, our brand globally without having the work that the both of you do. So congratulations on all of that. But the reason, I, th I think, the reason behind uh, why you guys are so good at what you do is you've been here a really long time. <laughs> so uh, we were just talking about that uh, before we uh, began the, the, the recording today. Um, Sarah, you're coming up on 20 years? 20 years this summer, wow, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank and you. Marcus, it's 18? 18, wow. that's right. Um, obviously, great place to work is a great place to work. Otherwise, you would have left a long time ago. Uh, but what what's the reason behind why you've stayed for so long and you know what have you learned from that experience well i i started off with a great boss that was one reason which i was, was his boss yeah. obviously <laughs> 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 um, but i was really attracted to the mission that was what got me to switch from my my job before this one um, and the company before this uh, it was just helping make the world a better place with something i could wake up and come do um, and then when I got here, I thought, this is great. I'll be here for two years. Um, this will be amazing. I obviously got that two years prediction totally wrong. But, um, you know, I found over the years that that mission was really true. And the people that were coming to help do that mission were, were amazing. And so through the years, we've just cycled through, you know, more people have grown at it. And every year, the people are still incredible and amazing. So those two things, the mission and the people are just, you know, just keep giving me energy to be here. Yeah. Sarah, what about you? What's, you know, 20 years, uh, you must have had someone come along and say, hey, you should come work for me at some point. And why did you choose not to go somewhere else? Yeah, I, it, the same reasons that Marcus is really talking about, our, our mission and the people that I, that I work with. Um, and I think that every year I've been able to see the opportunity for the next year. And I, I never wanted to miss out on that. I think every year we have the opportunity with all the amazing companies we work with to have a bigger and bigger global impact and really change the world. And so when those opportunities came, I always thought, well, I, I put this much time in. I really want to see what the, the next few years look like. And mm -hmm. so far, they've always been exciting and challenging and, and wonderful. Okay. I have to explain to our listeners about what exactly it is that you guys do because, you know, titles alone don't reveal the, the amount of work that we do, obviously. Uh, but Sarah, as the, the Vice President of Global Recognition, um, you know, you oversee all of these lists that we publish, uh, the rankings, the ranked best workplaces list that we uh, publish in partnership with Fortune. Uh, and you have a team of folks that, that work with you on doing that. And it's not just here in the U.S. now, but it's you're looking at the global uh, sort of purview of all the lists that are being done by all of our global affiliates now, as well as the uh, world's best list. Um, and so I want you to talk a little bit more about what that process is like. I know that you get this question all the time about how can my company get on a list? Mm -hmm. you know, and how do you respond to that question? Sure. Well, there's there's a lot of technical responses in terms of steps to, to get on the list. And, you know, you need to complete an employee survey and you need to um, take a culture audit and a culture brief. But if the question's really about, you know, how do I make the list in terms of quality of my experience, it's always focus on your people. I think the media tends to cover perks and programs because that's an easy sound bite to talk about what makes a company a great place to work. But when you look at employee feedback, what you actually see is that they're not saying that, you know, this is a great place to work because we have a cafe, because we have an on-site um, child care center. They're talking about the respect with which they're 
treated. And so you can have the same programs in two different organizations, but the difference and the reason why one company is making the list and the other isn't is because of the quality of that employee experience there. Uh, Marcus, you know, as the, the head of our uh, research and data science team, uh, you work with two wonderful data scientists uh, who also, like you, uh, are very eloquent in the ways in which you sort of dissect all this great data, this rich, you know, um, treasure trove of data that we collect through our surveys. And so you're the one who are finding the trends. Um, around what's happening uh, in the discussion around workplace culture and what companies are, are doing to improve the work experience uh, for their employees. How do you do what you do? You know, how, do you, how do you sit and just look at numbers and then figure out, hmm, I'm seeing signs of change or, or you know, just uh, waves of change? Well, you hit on one of the reasons to start. I've got just an incredible team, um, and that's both my immediate team but the extent of team at great place to work. We have a lot of smart people that are really curious. They stay in touch with the trends of the world, um, both within work and outside of work. They're connected to leading thought leaders um, and really kind of follow those trends. So anytime I find something interesting in the data or somebody on my team finds something interesting in the data, we can take it around the office and kind of say, well, what, what does this mean to you? Um, and by the time we've walked to the kitchen and back to our desk, we've gotten five amazing insights to say, well, this might be the trend you're seeing, this is the trend you're seeing. Um, and that just leads us down the path of figuring out like, oh, this is really unique and different um, and gives us a story that we can share with our clients and others that are interested in making their workplace a great one for, for all their employees. As part of your work from the, the research side of things within our company, you're also the co-author of a number of our research reports. We did that series, Innovation by All, uh, last year, four parts which our listeners can find on our website. Um, and you really created this new metric that no one's ever really thought of and how to measure how good a company is at innovation, um, the IVR, the Innovation Velocity Ratio. And how did you come up with that? You know, Because I think that it's been profoundly uh, impactful to our clients mm -hmm. because they're looking at it and they're able to actually measure from quarter to quarter or year to year, depending on how often they want to survey their employees, how well they're able to improve at getting all of their employees inspired enough to want to participate in innovation. The IVR came about because we were looking at innovation. It was a trend that was important to our clients and customers, and we were seeing it coming up more and more in our own research and data and, and employee comments. Um, we actually added it to one of our as one of our criteria for selecting the best workplaces. Uh, and what we found when we did that was actually the best workplaces that really thrived on that component of our methodology uh, actually had better revenue performance than their peers by a factor of like five and a half times. Um, so we said, well, that's amazing. What's happening there? And what we found was that you could go back and measure it. The, the people themselves would tell you that in their surveys why they were experiencing innovation or not. Um, and so we just really drove down into like what was happening. Um, and we found this really interesting pattern that when people felt they had uh, few or no opportunities to innovate or make meaningful change at the workplace, they actually started to talk about this experience at work of feeling left out, feeling isolated, harassed, maybe even threatened. They just lacked that sense of safety at work. On the other hand, when people really felt that they had a lot of opportunities, we saw that that was driven by the sense of safety and purpose. Um, and we realized if you compare those two numbers, you've got a really simple metric that told you um, how much innovation capacity you had, how much innovation your, your company could expect from its employees. Hmm. Talking more about the IVR, you know, you know, the simple, the quick one sentence explanation of it is that you're looking at a ratio, so mm -hmm. two numbers. There's three stages. Stages, yeah. three stages, yeah. right, yeah. which are? Friction, right. functional, and accelerated. So. Okay. So, uh, off the top of your head, do you remember what the numbers are for each stage or no? Uh, if you're in a friction company, you're probably about two people that are experiencing innovation or, or for every one that's not. For a functional, it's about six to two. And if for uh, accelerated, they actually have about 11 to two. Right. So about double what the, the functional group has. Right. Just to give the perspective to our listeners about what th they would might see if they were to do their own IVR calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Well, actually, Chris, we did a normative study of the U.S. workforce, and we found it was actually the, the inverse in the average workplace experience. There were five people that were experiencing friction 
to every two that were accelerated. So it's the opposite of, mm -hmm. of what Marcus is talking about in mm -hmm. the in the typical workplace. So what you're saying then is that in the average U.S. workplace is that innovation doesn't exist. <laughs> it exists, but there's an enormous amount of drag. It's yeah. it's that experience of, of being slowed down, of not having other people to, to help you and move forward when you're trying to innovate in the organization. Yeah. Not the fun RuPaul kind of drag. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think, I'm just, yeah. Chris, I, I think just building on what Sarah said, the, a lot of workplaces haven't realized they can maximize the full potential of their workforce. And so the best workplaces show us you can. And when you do that, you get everybody engaged in innovation. You can grow your business much faster. Most workplaces still think of innovation as something you silo um, or something that uh, you know just the CEO leads. But mo the best workplaces realize, no, innovation is a volume game. Innovation is an everyone game. If we get everybody engaged in it, we're going to do a lot better. Um, and that's one of their advantages uh, and just in the market and against their peers. Um, so maybe we just gave their secret away, but uh, it's a good secret everybody should lean into. This podcast is brought to you by DHL Express, the global market leader in international express delivery. Recognized globally on Great Place to Work's world's best workplaces list, DHL Express makes a positive contribution to the world by connecting people and enabling global trade while being committed to responsible business practices, purposeful environmental activities, and corporate citizenship. Learn more at DHL.com. Marcus, earlier you were saying that uh, one of the reasons that you've stayed with Great Place Work for 18 years is that uh, you were, you know, bought into the mission early on. Um, but over that time, the mission has somewhat changed and evolved as workplace mm -hmm. culture has evolved everywhere. Um, where do you, or how do you view where things stood with what our mission is 18 years ago to where it is today? And what what has caused our company to change and adapt and evolve mm -hmm. along with just the way that business has adapted and evolved over the years? Mm -hmm. Well, our, our mission has always been rooted in creating a great workplace and believing that's a transformational power in society, that if everybody had a great workplace, then they're going to be better for their families, better in their communities, and just have a better life. So that's what we've always focused on. <clears throat> and early on in our time, it was um, just trying to convince companies that it was possible and worth doing. So that was what the work of the mission was at that point. Um, over the 18 years, I'm, I'm happy and proud to say that we've played a little part in that a lot of companies now believe it's possible and they strive to make it happen. And what we realized was that actually we need to raise the bar, that you can't just be a great place to work. Um, in our data and with the companies that we're getting there, uh, they're a great place to work for many, but not all. Um, and that was the distinction that we were seeing that we needed to push into next. So it really was just a, a natural evolution of the success we had and where we needed to get to, which is making sure that by 2030, everyone has a great place to work for all. Um, yeah. Sarah, do you have anything you want to add to that? I'd say also part of it is a trend of globalization, right? <clears throat> so when you're just thinking about creating great places to work for all, and there are so many permutations of that. I want to talk a bit more about what is happening today. Um, today is the first day of the 2020 summit. We have a long day ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, we started this recording around 6.30 in the morning, and I know that um, Marcus has a uh, focus session that you're doing today, Today, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow. yes. Okay. Yeah, so fun. let's talk about the, uh, the focus session that you're um, going to be leading tomorrow. I just want our listeners to know that all of our content from our summit is recorded. Um, main stage will have video on our website and the focus sessions you can listen to our audio recordings of them and so after you've listened to this wonderful episode of Better by Great Place to Work you can go back to our website and you can find the recordings from all these focus sessions the videos from the main stage um, but tell me a bit about what your focus session will be about Marcus. Yeah one of the topics that we've been studying for the last couple of years is around for all leadership um, so for all leadership is what we have found to be the new type of leadership that companies need to, to thrive in today's world. So for all leaders are ones that are really able to care for every employee that's on their team, create connections across the business, and really demonstrate the empathy and humility and just complex problem solving you need when your, your company might be going through automation or recessions or, or whatever's going to you know, break out in, in the day that, um, in the market that day. Um, and so my session is to try to 
share some of that research, but we're actually really happy because we're going to bring in actual for all leaders to come in and talk about their experiences. We found when you talk with them, you, you see the difference. You see in how they look at their teams, how they talk, um, and the different things they do to create the sense of purpose, the sense of comfort, the sense of um, safety um, for, with their teams that really helps them be great. We're going to have them talk about those moments. Okay. I'm sorry that I have to miss it because I'll be here recording the podcast. But um, Sarah, you're going to be hosting five focus sessions? Yes. Wow. And I know there's some a few, there's a few repeats so it's that if a attendee to the summit can't make it for one of the scheduled times that they can go to one of the other ones. But can you talk a bit about uh, the sessions you're leading? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, the three different topics are one, you know, how companies can apply to be certified and be considered for a best workplaces list. And that's a fun topic for me to get to talk about because that's really what our great team focuses on um, in the U.S. And, and now around the world. Um, and we have some exciting changes that are really making things both uh, simpler for people to participate in that process and much more focused and, and getting even more out of that. So I'm talking about that today. And then I get to lead two amazing panels. Um, the first one is going to be about how to create a great workplace in blue collar environments, mm -hmm. um, which is a topic I'm, I'm really excited about because I think sometimes um, you know there's more coverage around how do you create a great workplace and maybe professional services environments. Um, and so we really wanted to explore what it looks like there. And we have some amazing speakers at uh, Dow and New Star who are going to be fleshing that out. Mm. Um, and in addition, we're going to be talking about uh, how to get, create a great workplace for parents, which is a topic that I feel really passionate about. Um, Chris, I remember we were working together when you were at Fortune, and we started up the Best Workplace for Parents list. And at the beginning, there was a suggestion it should be a Best Workplace for Mothers. And both you and I said, no, no we're going to make this yeah. the best workplace for, for parents list, which I feel really proud of is, yeah. and is important. Um, and so we're going to be talking a lot there. One of the things I'm excited about to talk about is that um, to shift the narrative around work-life balance, because certainly that's incredibly important for parents, but it's also important for everyone. And in fact, our data shows that men with no kids are more likely to um, have their decision to stay with their organization affected by their work-life balance than mothers are. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly not the, you know, the, the common refrain there. Yeah. So we'll be talking about um, how to reshift what it really takes to make a great workplace for parents and have it include work-life balance but not be limited to that topic. What makes you get really uh, annoyed when people sort of equate the, uh, the benefits for women or for, for uh, mothers with just being an overall great workplace for women? Yeah, well, you know, obviously not all women are mothers. Um, and when we are mother, I'm, I'm happy to be a mother. That's a really um, important part of my identity, but it's not the only part of my identity. Um, and I love the way, where I work, and I'm, I'm really passionate about that. And I want to be seen in my workplace both for, uh, you know, being a complete person um, with a life outside work and being a mother, but also for how I show up in the workplace. And so I think it's just foolhardy to equate uh, women with motherhood only because there are, you know, obviously wonderful employees that are not mothers. And also um, what we've seen is that uh, the narrative about what it means to become a mother starts to shift how you think about how you need to treat women in the workplace. We find that um, women actually have more commitment to their workplace, find more meaning in their work when they've become mothers, and that's not what you hear. And so there's actually an opportunity for workplaces to rise to that challenge and step up because women are going to have more concerns about uh, promotions equity, about the communication they receive in the workplace after becoming mothers. They're not less invested, they're worried that you're less invested. And so that's an opportunity to step up. up. And also, actually, I feel passionately about it for because of this guy who's sitting next to me, who I've worked with for nearly 20 years, and who I know is an amazingly dedicated father. And I want him to have the same um, investment in, in his work-life balance and not just have you know the thoughts about parenthood be limited to, to women. Hmm. That's a great point. One of the things we've seen in our data, though, is a trend by generation that that trend Sarah's describing is happening. Millennials, in their written feedback to us, speak a lot about paternity leave. They see that um, 
uh, paternal roles aren't fixed. It's really about who's who wants to be there with the kid, and everybody wants to be there with the kid, but they also, as Sarah so eloquently described, want to be successful at work. Um, and so this is a, a really big trend that workplaces need to rise to. Marcus, uh, your team, along with Ed Fraunheim, our colleague, uh, have, have written these uh, recent two new reports that have just come out. I mentioned the Innovation by All series on, for, that you can find on our website, but we also have two new ones, the hidden pieces of the puzzle around de- uh, diversity and inclusion, and then the future of work, mm-hmm. uh, the new future of work. Can you talk a little bit about the findings from the research that uh, you did for those two reports? I know that one of the big topics is how to prepare for a coming recession should we have one. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and that that's featured um, in our Future of Work report, actually both reports to a degree. With our data, we have a chance to go back in time and look at what companies were experiencing before the Great Recession. Um, and so we took that opportunity to say, is there something their employees were telling us back in 2007, 2008, before everything kind of went haywire, that would predict when a recession is going to happen, or more importantly, what's going to predict whether your company is going to succeed during a recession, trying to see if there's a way to you know, help leaders look around the corner. And one of the things we found was that, yes, employees could tell you, and it was often really marginalized and underrepresented employees that were the ones that could tell you whether a company was going to thrive during a recession or, or flatline. Um, and so for us, it was a really big finding because it showed that if you really listen to your employees, if you really create a great place to work for all, you're building a business that's built to survive, um, not to survive recessions, but to thrive through them. Um, and so it was just a really great business piece um, around why you need to do this. And that was the intent with some of the, the research was to try to, for the hidden pieces of DNI, to create um, some new evidence and new arguments for DNI leaders to feel like, oh, there's new hope, new tools, new insights we can use to um, continue this work we're trying to do. Because um, we know the DNI community, we love their work, and we also know it's really tough work. It's really easy to get burned out. Um, so we're trying to find some inspirational new ideas that could help them keep doing the great work that they're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, are you going to be attending the DNI forum today? I am. Yeah. Yes. So for for both of you, I'm curious. Uh, what are you most looking forward to uh, at the summit this year uh, beyond you know seeing Melissa Etheridge at our social event tonight? <laughs> I always love honestly hearing Michael Bush speak. I mean, I, this is something that I left out, but why is great place to work a great place to work? It's it's Michael Bush's leadership, um, both in terms of like the scope of our mission and just the, the day-to-day uh, for our colleagues here. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But in general, I mean, I look at this summit as an opportunity to be a touchstone, not only for us, but for the, the broader community to support us all in the work that we do the rest of the year. Because if you think back to that normative study that we did of the U.S. workforce, less than half of the U.S. workforce is actually experiencing a trust-based workplace. And so, you know, a lot of the companies here are fortunate to be able to work for certified companies or, or best workplaces. Um, But that's not the common experience. And so to come here and get to be in a community of people who also get it and are working hard to solve the challenges that you're challenging, that that you're facing, is a huge resource and inspiration for the rest of the year. And I love just being part of that energy and and getting the tips and getting the inspiration of, of seeing how committed corporations are actually to creating great workplaces, which I don't think is a, you know, a common narrative and not something that most of the public gets to see. Mm-hmm. And Marcus, what are you looking forward to? Uh, many of the same things that Sarah is. Um, she summed it up so well. I, I, I always walk away from this. I think the weeks heading up into this, my wife will tease me and say, oh, you're grumbling about the summit again because we're getting ready for the event. You're you know, getting your sessions ready. You're, we're figuring out all the last minute logistics and I'll be grumbling, complaining about it. And she's like, just stop it. You're gonna come home after that summit and not stop talking about it for a month. <laughs> um, and I just, so I, I find so much inspiration here. And it's not just because of the great speakers we get, but um, you know, telling really honest, authentic stories. Um, but it's also just that community that comes every year. Um, you know, we get a lot of repeat um, folks coming, so it's like a reunion with them. Um, and but then you have you know 60% new folks coming every year, and it's like they're just in the same kind of energy, looking for this community they can be a part of to create a great place to work. And they found like their home, and that energy is just uh, 
it's great. It makes it go for the whole year. Yeah. Now, this is our 17th annual summit, and I think I've probably attended probably about 10 of them from the time when I was at Fortune, and then, of course, now the past two as an employee, a great place to work. Uh, and they, they grow and they get bigger from year to year. Um, but one of the sort of uh, things that I look forward to each year is the fact that there is a sense of community. It's a sense of family, uh, people that you do see every year. And you get to catch up with them, you get to see them and, uh, and get some face time with people who you sometimes still work with directly, especially if they are from companies that appear on the list from year to year. We do have a lot of returnees to the list who, you know, we consider them to be, you know, the all stars of, of making the 100 best every single year or for at least for the past 20 years. Um, <clears throat> is there one particular um, company that you can think of that always has really strong presence from year to year that you guys, when you like someone you can think of? The yeah. truth is many of them are our sponsors. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. they're incredibly dedicated. Like, I, I don't yeah. want to miss anyone, but yeah, like yeah. EY is going to be here every year. Yeah. Accenture is right. going to be here every year. Um, they, they really are committed to uh, creating great workplaces, not only in their organizations, but providing leadership to, to others. And mm-hmm. we are incredibly grateful for their, their sponsorship because yeah, it makes absolutely. all of this possible. And, um, addition to just showing up at the conference, one of the things that's, that's really lovely about some of the companies we work with is that they try and share the experience of working at their organizations with summit attendees. So for example, um, and, and this is where hopefully you have some, I don't know all the examples this year, but maybe you can speak to the Accenture immersion mm-hmm. experience or you know, last year Hilton really gave you a sense by letting us walk behind the scenes of how they um, run their hotels of what it feels like to be in their employees shoes. I view part of the work that we do in creating lists as giving pic- people a picture of the mountaintop. You know, what does it look like up there and why do you want to do the hard work to climb and where are you on that path? Um, and so I think that when you have a chance to interact with our best companies, it's another chance to viscerally feel what does it look like and feel like to be at a best workplace, because not everyone really understands that or even believes that it's possible. And I think that's an important role that they play. So Marcus and Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today and being the, uh, the kickoff of the first day of the 2020 summit. Um, it's been a pleasure chatting with you both. Our pleasure. Thank Thanks, you, Chris. Chris. You've been listening to Better by Great Place to Work. The producers are Lizelle Festejo and Katie Van Geffen. Audio and video production is by Resonate Recordings. Better is generously sponsored by DHL Express, the global market leader in international express delivery. Tell us about your great workplace experience by finding us on social media. We can be reached on Facebook and LinkedIn at Great Place to Work and on Twitter and Instagram at GPTW underscore US. Also tell your friends about Better, which can be found wherever you download your favorite podcasts.